Welcome to worship. You, you made it through the time change. Uh, I have a few announcements I want to uh, bring to your attention. Uh, first of all, the Easter Lily dedications. If you'd like to dedicate a flower in honor of someone or in memory of someone, uh, you need to get that uh, form in fairly soon, uh, by next Sunday, in fact. Uh, I'd like you to mark on your calendars the churchwide cleanup day on um, 
Saturday morning between nine and noon here at the church on April 1st, April Fool's Day. And um, there are indoor and outdoor things to do. Uh, we're going to be focusing some attention on Fellowship Hall, which is one of the places that people who are guests in the church um, see quite frequently. That's where several outside groups meet and um, where parents come and pick up uh, children for, from uh, Bump. And um, so we really have some work to do down there for beautifying, and I hope you're able to give us some time on that morning. It would be, it, and last year it was fun to work together, and we'll get the church looking great for Easter. Also wanted to just clarify, on Monday Thursday, there are actually two options for a worship service. One is at 6 o'clock in the Maloney Center, and it's for a family foot washing service. Families, uh, as part of that service, will be washing each other's feet. And, um, and then at 7 o'clock, for, open for anyone at, in the sanctuary at 7, and that will be a special service that includes communion and also um, prayer stations. And then uh, I wanted to point out on Good Friday, unlike previous years where you've had sometimes an evening service, we're going to have a service at noon on Good Friday. Um, also wanted to just share that uh, some of the extra flowers on the altar today are um, uh, given by Mike Gadula in honor and memory of his brother uh, who died just last week and whose service was celebrated yesterday. And so you may want to use this visual reminder uh, to thank Mike. And uh, with all those announcements, I'd invite you to turn your hearts and minds to the worship of God as we settle ourselves in the ministry of music.
Sing and listen and pray and welcome one another and let us wish it. The opening hymn is uh, 2132, and if you'll pull out the uh, Faith We Sing, you'll find it there. seated, please. We are going to hear about the churches of our circuit. Amazingly, in that short period of time, I've misplaced the clicker, which is really astonishing, because I just had it. Oh, well. So part of, uh, there are many new things that are happening in the United Methodist Church, even as there are things that are going by the wayside. And one of the new things that's happening is that our district is inviting um, churches in our area to be in a circuit together. It's not all clear what that means, but we're invited to find ways to collaborate and be in supportive ministry with churches that are assigned to us in our area. And I have slides up here of all of all of them, and there'll be nine of us in total. And um, Listed with each one, I have some of the outreach ministries that are currently happening at those places. So Asbury North, next. There we are. There's Broad Street United Methodist. Church for All People. Clare UMC. Gates Fourth. Livingston UMC, Thurman Avenue, Wesley Church of Hope. So uh, Asbury is just two miles away from us, uh, very close to East High School and uh, OSU East Hospital. The farthest church from us is Wesley Church of Hope, six miles away. and. Um, 
we have a meeting coming up where we'll be meeting with our circuit and finding out some of the gifts and interests that we all bring to the table. And in the meantime, I'd like for us to continue to be in prayer for uh, the circuit. And also, if any of you are, are just interested in the idea of collaborating with some of our partners, uh, you would be welcome. I would let me know. I'd love to have you come uh, to this introductory meeting. And um, one of the things that is exciting to me about this circuit is that there are churches that are historically African American. There are churches that are um, very intentionally uh, diversified in terms of socioeconomic uh, relationships uh, across difference. There are churches that have um, really a nice assortment of, of uh, outreaches to their community. And I believe that, that uh, we, will, we will be able to make this a creative, exciting thing to be in circuit together. So I'm going to ask us uh, to have a prayer and to continue praying throughout this uh, season of Lent. Dear God, we thank you for the rich diversity of the body of Christ. We thank you for people whose hearts and minds are aligned with ours around worshiping you in your fullness and in serving our neighborhoods, bringing light and hope and peace. And we pray, Lord, that you will stir up your creative spirit within us and draw out persons who are interested in collaborating and being partners, that all of our churches may grow in vitality and that we all might have an impact in our neighborhoods for your kingdom. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's scripture reading comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 17, verses 1 through 7. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, what shall I do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not?
I may have just a moment to remember. I grew up in the church that my mother had grown up in and her parents had grown up in and her grandparents had grown up in. We had our own pew. If you were standing in the pulpit, it would be the third pew to your left. And it was our pew. It was really comfortable because when you sit in one place for that many years with your relatives, you just don't want to leave, even if it's a special event. Now, this is a congregation in which I hope this doesn't happen. People never have any way to look around except at the one they've always been in. And that's why when we say sharing Christ's love, it means stand up. And if there's somebody nearby that you don't know yet, well, you know what to do. I have all the children. Great. Good morning, friends. Let's start by saying our verse together. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Okay. So I have a test for you. Ready? What's this? 
Scissors. And how do scissors help us? They cut things, don't they? Paper or whatever. I have scissors that cut fabric. Can you imagine that? I know. What's this? Measuring cup. And how does this help us? With baking, okay, because we can fill how much flour or sugar we need and get the correct amount. All right, that helps us. So what's this? A phone. And how does my phone help me? It helps me communicate, doesn't it? So I can make phone calls on it. What else kind of things can I do? I could take pictures, crossword puzzles, okay. I can track my husband only when he's on his bicycle, okay? Yeah, all sorts of stuff on it, all right. So all three of these things are items, are equipment that help us do things, right? We can say that they're kind of the Good Samaritans of equipment. But today I want to talk about people who are good Samaritans, not just equipment. And what's a good Samaritan? Well, a good Samaritan is someone who helps us do things, and they don't expect to be repaid in any way. They just do it for us, and we're not expecting it. And there's, there's good Samaritans all around us. In fact, a couple of years ago, there was a good Samaritan at the Kroger down on Broad Street, that was very helpful to our family. It was Christmas Eve day late, and I found out that I was going to have four more people for Christmas Day dinner than I expected. And my little roast that I bought for eight people had to stretch to, to 12 people, and I didn't think that was going to work. So my daughter-in-law, Heather, grabs her keys and she grabs her coat, and she starts out the door, and I go, wait, wait, Heather, here's cash, here's, 20, here's 40 bucks to take. I don't know what size roast you're going to find. And she goes, oh, no, don't worry about it. I have my card. Not a problem. I go, okay. So, you know, that young group, they like those cards. No, not cash. So um, <clears throat> she goes to Kroger, and, of course, it is just slammed with people because it's pretty close to closing time. And she goes, and there's just a couple of roasts left. She picks it up. She takes it to the uh, checkout, and she's about the next person on the checkout, and wham, horror of horrors occur. Kroger's system dies, and they won't take any credit cards or any debit cards. The only way you can pay for things is by cash. And there's Heather emptying her purse, counting her nickels, counting her pennies, counting her quarters, trying to look for dollar bills to pay for this roast. Well, there was a good Samaritan right behind her. And I believe it was a lady. She puts down enough money on the top of the roast to pay for it. And she says, here, let me help you. And right away, Heather's like, well, let me have your number. Let me have your address. We'll get the money. No, no. She says, Merry Christmas. So that day, like the woman at the well helping Jesus, we were helped by this good Samaritan so that on Christmas Day, we had a blessed dinner. So let's say a prayer. I've said a prayer for that lady many times. Okay, dear God, thank you for the Good Samaritans. Guide us to be Good Samaritans. Amen. Have a great week. Pray with me. Thank you, God, for calling us together.
This is your day, and it's a day for us that makes all the rest of our days worthwhile. We're gathered here seeing people we know, discovering people we will know, welcoming those we are meeting, and being glad that we are together, and especially being glad that you are here with us. We know that you, God, are always everywhere. It is here that we are together with each other. And we know your love. It's been a time with some problematic discoveries. Some people we have known about and depended on were not as trustworthy as we thought. Children suddenly saw an image that was crass and inappropriate on their morning information service. People on whom we have depended have not been as faithful as we expected, and the result will be with us for some time. Half the world away, we are hearing about nations at war and lands where Earthquakes and other dangerous and sometimes deadly occurrences are causing deaths and losses. A dangerous world for those who give, we live in such surroundings, and we pray for them today. For most of us, these difficult circumstances are simply things about which we hear, and they cause serious difficulties to people we are unlikely ever to meet. Remind us, we pray, that you love all people everywhere and let that encouragement enable us to do what we can to make better lives for people in difficult circumstances. Thank you for the opportunities you give us to learn, to teach, and to share. Thank you for the knowledge that in enables us to work and to learn and to benefit from the work of others. We thank you that we can hear your word and its call to us to be faithful. We thank you for friends and family to be able to help others to find ways to be of service and blessing. Open our eyes and minds and hearts, Heavenly Father, so that we can share the love with which you so generously let us be your people and enable us to be your workers and messengers and the people of your light. That is our prayer as we pray your prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Give us this day our daily bread. We forgive those who us. Lead us to temptation. But deliver us from evil. Kingdom. For the offertory today, here is the prayer. Lord Jesus, who for our sake didst become poor, that by thy poverty we might become rich, grant to thy people so to give of their substance as to acknowledge that they belong wholly to thee. For thine own sake.
gives to us, O God, we give you thanks. And with these gifts, we share your goodness. You may be seated. For this story uh, from the Gospel of John in the fourth chapter, we're going to again watch the clip because it's so much easier to follow as a dialogue. Uh, before we start that, I just had meant to announce uh, next Sunday we take up a special offering for the United Methodist Committee on Relief. Uh, so it is the, the main offering every year that funds the infrastructure that makes sure that that agency is available to deploy services to people all around the world. So I just wanted to remind you of that. And now let's follow the Gospel of John and the story of the woman at the well. So when Jesus heard what was being said, he left Judea and went back to Galilee. On his way there, he had to go to Samaria. In Samaria, he came to a town named Sychar, which was not far from the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by the trip, sat down by the well. It was about noon. Why are you talking with her? No 
and the woman left her water jar and went back to the town. So the disciples started asking among themselves, could somebody have put him food? My food is to obey the will of the one who sent me, and to finish the work he gave me to do. You have a saying, four more months and then the harvest. <coughs> but I tell you, take a good look at the fields. The crops are now ripe and ready to be harvested. The one who reaps the harvest is being paid, gathers the crops for eternal life. So the one who plants, and the one who reaps will be glad together. For the same is true. Someone plants, someone else reaps. I have sent you to reap the harvest in a field where you did not work. Others work there. And you profit from their work. Many of the Samaritans in that time believed in Jesus because the woman had said, He told me everything I have. So when the Samaritans came to him, they built him to stay with him, and Jesus stayed there two days. Many more believed because of his message, and they told the woman, We believe now, not because of what you said, but because we ourselves have heard him, and we know that he is the Savior of the world. There's a wonderful song that goes along with this, um, and Steve is going to sing the, the verses for us, and then we'll join in with Dixie on Fill My Cup, Lord. It's in your hymnal, but you may already know it. 241.
How many of you have heard uh, sermons about the woman at the well before? Yes. And um, you may have heard uh, some things that talk about it in terms of the woman being someone who Jesus is able to identify her sin and to implicitly offer her a new way of life. And um, I want to I want to offer a slightly different way of thinking about this passage. I don't know if my way is more right than what you've heard before, but I, I want to share some different perspectives. Uh, the Gospel of John is one seamless narrative. Uh, it talks about many of the same events that are talked about in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Jesus heals, Jesus teaches, uh, and Jesus invites new people into the kingdom. But in the Gospel of John, the stories are told in a way that have multiple levels of meaning, symbolic and metaphorical and rich. The first thing I want to share in the Gospel of John, in the second chapter, we're in the fourth chapter with the woman at the well, in the second chapter, we find Jesus doing the very first miracle that he does in this gospel. And it happens at the wedding at Cana. And it's making the water turn into wine so the party can continue. In John chapter 2, the very next chapter, we hear of an encounter where the disciples of John the Baptist come to him disturbed and somewhat distressed because disciples of Jesus are baptizing more people than they are, and they want to know what he thinks about it. And in that passage, John responds to them saying, you know, I am not the bridegroom. The bridegroom is coming, and those who are receiving him, the bride, that's the people of Israel, I'm, I'm just standing to the side and rejoicing that this union is happening of the Messiah who is figuratively the groom to Israel, the bride. And his joy was full. Now we also need to understand the context of uh, the history of the Israelite people and its really important role that Many marriages began at a well. You might remember some of them from Sunday school stories. Isaac found his wife, Rebecca, when his father's steward met her at a well and affected the matchmaking there. The meeting of Jacob and Rebecca at a well begins one of the Bible's loveliest love stories. By the way, it's not a coincidence that they are meeting at Jacob's well. <clears throat> Moses uh, was chasing away people who were intimidating seven young women feeding their flocks. And when their father came and found that Moses had helped them out, he promised Zipporah as a bride to Moses in gratitude. So. Weddings are on the mind. And then we come to the story of the woman at the well, a Samaritan woman. It's an interesting factor that is oftentimes unacknowledged that right at the very beginning of this story, the woman calls attention to the fact that they are representing two different peoples. You are a Jew and I'm a woman. Why are you talking to me? That was extraordinary because of the histories of the two peoples, long-standing histories, that uh, Jews would have seen anything Samaritan as tainted with kind of idolatry and would not have had anything to do. In fact, most Jews would walk a long ways to get around the land of Samaria when they had to travel north just from the south. And uh, the history goes back quite a long way. Uh, it really in, becomes very, very clear when the kingdoms are divided after King David 
But it perhaps goes back even before that when there were two places of worship. The worship um, at the site at Mount Gerizim was prior to the construction of the temple in Jerusalem, which was where Jews worshiped. Uh, the Samaritans saw themselves as uh, God's chosen people, but they saw their story being contained in the first five books of the Bible, and they expected the, prophet, the Messiah to be a prophet like Moses who would restore true worship in Israel, the northern kingdom of Samaria, where it had begun. Uh, they were part of a northern kingdom, which is called Israel, that was overrun by Assyria in the 8th century BCE. And they were resettled with foreigners as an intentional policy of the king of Assyria, sent in five different ethnic groups to settle their land. Each one of those groups brought in their own traditions of worship and the Israelite, the people of Judah, the southern kingdom, always thought, well, they just all got mixed in together with the worship of Yahweh, the God of Israel. It's one of the reasons, the main reason, that they kind of despised Samaritans. Jews, uh, their scripture included the historical books and the prophets. They expected the Messiah to be a king like David um, and to restore a kingdom. They believed the Samaritans were tainted, and um, their period of being overrun happened a few hundred years later than the Northerns, and they were taken off into exile and then brought back kind of intact uh, to reoccupy the land of Judah. So they felt like their line uh, was more pure. So the woman immediately calls attention to the fact that they're from two different uh, religious traditions that uh, do not look well at each other. And from there, uh, Jesus, asked, after asking her for the water, says he wants, uh, when she remarks on it, says that he wants to be able to give her living water and that she would want it also if she knew who he was. She immediately asks a kind of theological question. Well, here we are at the well of Jacob, our ancestor. Are you greater than Jacob? Who would that be? And, and Jesus then says, my water is living water. Anyone who drinks it will not be thirsty again. She is thinking theologically and already thinks, oh my goodness, this, this is a really strong claim for who he is. Jesus was alluding to uh, Ezekiel 36 and other portions of the Old Testament where the prophet says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I'll cleanse you from all your impurities and your idols. I'll give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you, removing your heart of stone and giving you a heart of flesh. Put my spirit in you. Well, so the woman says, then give me some of this water. And here Jesus says, what a strange, go and bring your husband. She says, I don't have a husband. And then he talks about the five husbands and the person who she's with then is no longer her husband. Now, some people think that that is calling out uh, kind of with preternatural knowledge, Jesus calling out her sinfulness. I just want to say, you can read through the whole passage and you never see an offer of forgiveness. You never see Jesus calling out sin. You don't see Jesus really even rebuking her. So I'm not sure that that makes the most sense. Instead, Jesus is talking about these five husbands and in 2 Kings, the 17th chapter, you can see uh, the Samaritan people had those five different um, ethnic groups relocated intentionally into their area. And those groups all brought their gods. And it was thought that the uh, Samaritans worshipped both gods simultaneously, Yahweh and those other gods. And that is like the five husbands. And as a consequence, 
he's kind of pointing the woman to the fact that her religious tradition is, has got some, some gaps. And then he, then he says, and you have no husband. The parts of the prophetic tradition that talk about this water, living water, new spirit being given where people can uh, have the spirit inside of them and are able to follow the law. Those are parts of the tradition that are not in the Pentateuch, in the first five books of the Bible. So he literally is saying, I have resources that are drawing out your tradition that you don't know about. So then she goes to, well, what about our mountain? Our, we worship on Gerizim. You say that you worship God in Jerusalem. Well, what's the right answer? And then he goes on to say, it's not your tradition is correct, and my tradition doesn't have this right either. There's something bigger at work that is happening now. I am bringing a new spirit for worship in spirit and truth that's not about a location, it's not about a church building, it's not about programs, it's about worship in spirit and truth. And at this invitation, the woman finally realizes this is some generous, big, new, wonderful thing that God is doing. And she says, I do believe the Messiah is coming to restore worship. And Jesus says, I am. Now you'll see the translation says, I am he. But actually, Jesus is using the words in Greek, ego, eimi, which are this flashback to what God, who spoke to Moses out of the burning bush, said when Moses said, who can I say you are when I go to people to tell them what you've asked me to lead them to do? God said, I am. Jesus says to her, speaking to a part of her tradition that would have been so familiar to her, I am. As I uh, think about this beautiful story, I am struck uh, every time I read it by a kind of different take of why it's wonderful. Today uh, and this week, as I've been wrestling with it, it struck me that um, we live in a world with so many different perspectives and uh, so much spin, so many people trying to get a narrative over on another person's narrative, so many polarized people claiming their truth and exclusive of other people's truth. And, and this story made me remember how much I want just real truth in a spirit of goodness and love. And I wonder if Jesus' discussion with this woman, the gentle way he approached their dialogue and conversation, the respectful way he understood her tradition and talked about his tradition. And I wondered if that was opening up within her something she wasn't entirely aware of, a hunger for something true and good. I wonder if it washed away her cynicism I wonder if it made her hope again. And I wonder if we can reclaim that also. When Jesus invited her into this truth, um, she was so excited she went to share it with others. And uh, I will say, I think probably the fact that so many people believed her so readily as the story recounts, is probably an indication that she was not viewed as a person of low or suspect status or a particularly sinful person. She was so excited to be able to talk about truth that was not 
excluding the Jews. It wasn't excluding the Samaritans. It was a truth that was available to everyone through a relationship and a way of grace and love and respect. And I, I wonder if that's just enough to take from this. If we think about welcoming others in this same spirit, even as a pastor, it's sometimes hard for me to share my faith with others because it feels bossy or arrogant, like I have all the answers, or I think maybe it's just about my experience. But this woman and her story with Jesus, where they met each other with open hearts and open minds, it opened doors in other people's hearts and minds simply by being invitational to a higher truth. I think we need to get excited about truth and the way that Jesus offers it with love and respect in peace. Our world needs us to love truth more than we love our labels, Republican and Democrat or progressive or traditional or whatever your labels might be, black or white or the world needs people who love truth and who love to share in the kind, loving, respectful way that Jesus did with the woman at the well. May it be so. Amen.
Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. Walk in Jesus' way. Go forth to love and serve God and your neighbor. And God will be with you always. Amen.